Welcome everyone. Thanks. Oh, yes. Recording. Uh, thank you so much for coming today. Um, I'm just going to speak really briefly to let you know who we are and what we're doing today, and then I'll be turning it over to our speaker. Um, so my name is Jess Guffey Calkins. I'm a community food systems educator with UW-Madison Extension Dane County, and our speaker today is Charlie, Bro Charlie Bloom. Charlie is an environmental health professional and licensing specialist at Wisconsin Department of Agriculture, Trade, and Consumer Protection. He conducts food safety inspections and ensures that businesses are in regulatory compliance to achieve safe products for end consumers. He attended the University of Wisconsin Oshkosh and earned a degree in environmental studies. Um, so today's free webinar for food entrepreneurs and farm-based food businesses is brought to you by the Food Entrepreneurship Ecosystem Development Initiative, which we call the FEED Initiative for short, and it is part of the UW-Madison Extension Community Food Systems Program. We're a statewide extension program that fosters equitable, resilient, and sustainable community food system development through research, evaluation, project-based partnerships, and programming like this. FEED has two major projects. One is our online webinar series for food and farming businesses in the spring, which is this. And then the second is our two-day summit for food and farming businesses in the fall. Um, so we don't have a exact date, but please anticipate that our fall summit is going to be happening in November of 2024 in Milwaukee. And um, if you're signed up to get emails from uh, us, updates about the program, you'll be getting the information about those dates um, through that. And then the last thing I want to mention is that we'll have a short session evaluation um, survey. And if you're able to take a minute just to fill that out, it, it helps us keep doing this kind of programming and um, keeping it free and improving our future programming. So we'll have some links in the chat for that. And at this point, I'm just going to turn it over to, Char to Charlie to share uh, information about today today's topic, which is good because I'm having trouble speaking. Okay, Charlie. All right. Yeah. Fantastic. Hope everybody can see my screen. Uh, thanks for having me. Good afternoon. <clears throat> like Jessica said, I am Charlie. I'm with the state of Wisconsin Department of Agriculture, Trade, and Consumer Protection. I'm on the licensing team within the Division of Food and Recreational Safety. Uh, one of the first things I want to highlight and, and one of the things that uh, we like to talk about here at the state is, is our various missions. So we have a couple department specific. We have a department specific mission and a department specific vision. And uh, I really like to think that everybody that I work with and, and my coworkers and, and those staff out in the field, we're really committed to this mission and vision. And we're really trying to deliver some of these programs as, as best we can. Um, you know, the, the efficient and effective, I like to really highlight that. That's something that we strive to do every day um, to be fair, efficient, effective, to make sure that we're getting back to folks in a timely manner, to ensure that we're getting them the right information in an in a appropriate amount of time. Um, we also have some division. Uh, you see down at the bottom, the mission and vision statements, but we're really, again, stressing that fair, effective, and efficient for the safe food, lodging, and recreational. Um, and so we act as a resource for agents of the state, for those agent health departments, in addition to uh, inspections and providing that regulatory and licensing authority for other parts of the state, depending on what each individual is doing. Uh, so who do I work for? Like I said, I work for the state. I uh, wanted to highlight there, there are a couple levels um, around us. Right. So we have the FDA, that's a federal level, the USDA, that's another federal level. We're at the state level. And then we also have agent health departments. And those are your county and your local health departments that would often um, it, uh, they, would, they would give you that that license. So that would be something where they would work with you to get that trans the transient license. So that's something that uh, I'll go over later, but I wanted to highlight kind of, and so you can see that hierarchy of what's going on and how uh, we work as a regulatory agency. Some things I want to touch on um, as we kind of get into uh, the nitty gritty of the codes, but the first thing is chapter 97. So that's food, lodging and recreation. This is what establishes that authority to license and inspect. So you can see um, we talk about dairy, warehouses, direct sale of eggs, food processing plants. And then uh, the one for transient would be the retail food. So that's 9730. 
Um, that's some place that we will quote or talk about when we're licensing folks and, and having discussions is, is sometimes we'll send out references to some of these state statutes. And so chapter 97 is a state statute that we oftentimes look at. Um, as we get down to the, the nitty gritty, as I like to say, but uh, uh, the administrative code. So these are ATCPs. I mean, you can see them laid out. Uh, so the state does, um, the Bureau of uh, Meat does the meat and meat products, but then as we get into 65, 70, 71, 75, these are things that the, um, the Food and Recreational Bureau would do or the Division of Food and Recreational Safety would do. So these are inspections that we complete. Um, and specifically, again, as we kind of narrow in on the transient license is that Administrative Code 75, that's your retail food establishments. That code has an appendix, uh, so it's ATCP 75 appendix. That is the Wisconsin Food Code. That is what is the regulatory authority for retail food establishments in the state of Wisconsin. And then specifically, um, we have chapter nine, which is the mobile retail. And then we have chapter 10, which is the, uh, the temporary food events or that transient. So kind of, we're getting down and down into it. So. Uh, we also at transient events, we'll see a lot of the honey and maple syrup and the eggs too. So I'll talk about that throughout the presentation, but I wanted to just at least show this. And so you can kind of see where we're coming from. And, and so you can look it up if you so choose, you know, if you want to take a look at some of those, they're all online, um, fairly easy to find. So we can start out the day talking about some exemptions. Um, and so the first thing that we have for retail exemption, and this is 75.063, uh, but we're talking about things that are prepackaged from an approved source and we're not processing on site and nothing is potentially hazardous. You know, So we're talking about doesn't need refrigeration or, or kept frozen for that food safety purpose. So those are the two things that we kind of look at if we were gonna go for an exemption. And so this is often something you'll see at a farmer's market. We're also looking for proper labeling of these uh, products, but, um, I don't know if you can see my mouse, I, I don't, uh, but so we have, uh, you know, like for example, if, you know, if the, if the packaged bread is coming from a bakery that's licensed, they wouldn't necessarily need to have a license at the farmer's market if it's meeting those ex exemption criteria, but it would need to be made um, it, the approved, that approved source. Same with anything, you know, see these different nuts, these different uh, fudge or, or chocolate or whatever the case is, but we're also be looking at proper labeling for these. Um, and so that's kind of what we're looking at for something like this. Again, it can be candy bars, pop, uh, those kind of facets. Um, as we're looking at, uh, raw agricultural product, uh, produce, this is another thing that we commonly see at, uh, farmers markets and, and different events, but we're not gonna be, there's no license required to retail or wholesale raw harvest cut. And the keyword there is harvest cut for the produce. Um, so we're not going past that first initial, get it off the vine or whatever the case is. Um, you know, if, like for example on that, if the, if the tomatoes are sliced, that would be processing. And then we would expect to see um, some sort of license or approved source for that. But because it's harvest cut, um, that's fine. Um, these type of products can be rinsed with fresh water and they can be packaged for convenience sake. So uh, what we see often is like a clamshell or a bag. Um, that's what we're kind of looking at for uh, that to, to fall underneath that exemption at raw agricultural produce. The next exemption I wanted to touch on is the home canning exemption. This is often called the, the pickle bill. Um, and you can see up there that we have the exact statute. So that 97.292B2. Uh, but what we're looking at is these requirements here. So one of the questions I get frequently asked is, is sauces and condiments. Uh, these would not fall underneath the pickle bill. Um, what we see on the, the left-hand side, that's what we're kind of looking at. Um, same with like pickled eggs. Those would be need made under, you know, if it was a, if it was canning and it was pickling, it would be need, need, need to be made under a food processing plant license. So you can see the list of products there. Another requirement that's defined in the pickle bill is where it needs to be sold. So only at community events or social events. So we're talking about farmers markets, bazaars, those kind of things. And then no more than $5,000 um, in sales per year. The other important facet is the labels. 
So on the label itself, we need to see this product was made in a private home, not subject to state licensing or inspection. It also needs to have a placard, but um, we want to see the name and address of the person who did the canning, the date of the canning, and then the order of ingredients and um, descending order of predominance. So you can see there, um, we also have the, the different uh, allergens we'd want to see if that was applicable to the situation. So what's not allowed under the pickle bill, uh, you can see a listing of products there. This is the things that we would expect to see some sort of license for or um, you know, exemption for. These are the things that we would maybe ask a few questions or if you were contacting us to ask about licensing, uh, we would ask, you know, are you gonna be under the pickle bill? What are you making? Uh, and if you were to say any of the things that we you know, would see up here or something else, then we would uh, kind of ask about that. Um, the other important thing is, is wholesale. So wholesale um, or consignment, that's relinquishing control. So you are not the one selling it directly to the end consumer, right? You are putting it on a shelf somewhere. You are, you are, you know, lack of a better phrase, like letting go of it at that point. And so that's something where we would want to see that wholesale license um, via the internet or out of state. And then uh, Pickle Bell sold licensed foods. We'd want to see... Um, a degree of that separation there. So canned food can also be made at a, under a food processing plant license and that would exist under that exemption that we talked about because it would be a shelf stable product. So let's say you had a food processing plant license, you were making a, a canned food or a, a sauce or a condiment or whatever the case was. Uh, that is something where the stand itself, if it was a true canning process, if it was shelf stable, then it would be uh, you know, retail exempt because it's falling underneath that exemption I spoke of um, a few slides ago. So this is what we would be, we, these are the questions we'd be asking about anybody doing a canned product if we saw that at a farmer's market or a, another transient event, you know, whatever the case is. Um, next we're going to eggs. So eggs are something that um, we also field uh, a good amount of questions on and, and calls on and, and emails. So definitely something that you can reach out to us about and we can help you either get licensed or send you the materials that you need or send you to that local health department that could help you get that transient license. But um, there is an exemption, it's Act 245. And it is. It talks about the food processing plant for sales at farm, egg sales route, and farmers markets. However, if you are selling on an egg sales route or a farmers market, you do need to have a transient license at that. Uh, you know whatever event it is, right? Uh, you know, that falling underneath that special event uh, definition. But we would be looking for that transient license, and that would be issued by your either local health department or the state of Wisconsin. You do need a food processing plant to wholesale eggs. That would be given to you by the state of Wisconsin. We would do an inspection. We would talk to you about the requirements there. And that's something that I can send to anybody who requests it. Uh, we do have that information out um, and we can send it out to you if you'd like to wholesale. Again, that's at relinquishing of control. So if you'd like to sell it to a, a local restaurant, for example, you have a, a lot of eggs and you say, well, I'm gonna sell it to a local restaurant that would require that food processing plant license. Um, one of the exemptions though, is, is selling the eggs on the premise where the eggs were laid. So that's the important part. It has to be the premise where the eggs were laid. Sometimes folks will ask about a farm stand or something along those lines. We, we, what my first question is, where were the eggs laid? Is that that same premise? Um, and eggs themselves need to be packaged in a carton. Um, we would like to see the labeled with the producer's name and address, the date the eggs are packed into the carton, a sell-by date within 30 days, and a statement indicating that the eggs in the package are ungraded and uninspected. In addition, packaged eggs must also be kept at an ambient temperature no higher than 41 degrees Fahrenheit at all times. So there's all really important facets to make sure that, um, you know, we're serving safe food. Poultry, um, this is something I think of like a tiered approach. So kind of how I made this slide. Uh, but this is also um, another brochure that we have that I, I send out quite frequently. Um, I'll see if I can, I think it's just sharing my, uh, 
my PowerPoint, but uh, if, if after this presentation, you'd like me to send you the brochure, absolutely can. Please reach out and we will send that out to you and, and kind of give you that direction. But these are the, the levels that we're looking at. So um, producer's premise, you can see here, slaughter and sell birds without inspection or license. Birds sold directly to consumer, labeled not inspection, name, address, and net weight. Farmer's market, we're going to want to see that transient retail food with license. Um, slaughtered and processed at a licensed meat facility, labeled not inspected in the name, address, and net weight. Sold to a retail establishment, that's where we're getting to the licensed meat establishment, bird by bird inspection. Um, that's something where I would, uh, if you contact us, I'm going to send you over to our meat and poultry licensing folks. They're kind of the, they're the experts on that. Um, if a product is sold over state lines, the processing facility must be under USDA inspection. So that's something I wanted to just talk about briefly, but if they're crossing those state lines, that's when we want to see that USDA inspection. Uh, livestock, so this is your cattle, swine, sheep. Um, again, we have that kind of tiered approach, but with the overarching of animal, animal by animal inspection at state or federal meat plant, full labeling, sold by weight, um, you know, meat slaughter by a farmer or mobile slaughter cannot be sold. And here's where we're going to talk about that transient retail food license, right? So another common call we get is we're sending out whatever, and we are getting it back in packaged and we're going to sell it at the farmer's market. Okay. You know, that's great. Um, we're going to want to see that transient license that will send out information on that. And we're going to want to see that you have a cooler freezer that's keeping temperature, right? That's something that we especially want to see. Um, if you're going to storage at the start at the farm, you got to have a retailer or warehouse license, which would uh, be dictated by your, by your location. Okay. Apple cider sales. Um, this is license exempt, um, producing farm and direct to consumer at community events. Um, you got to have that warning statement on there. If it's packaged and not pasteurized, cannot wholesale it and do not produce other products that require a license. So you can see there, this is 97. Again, this is, we're going back to that same, um, state statute, but it, it specifically says what we're looking at. So this is an exemption. And we're primarily engaged in like fresh fruits and vegetables, honey, cider, maple syrup produced by the operator of the retail food establishment is not engaged in other food processing activities. That's the important part of that one. Maple syrup. Um, here we're looking for, again, we're, we're looking at that same state statute. So looking exactly at that kind of that similar spot, but um, under 9729. So we're not quite at that retail part, but we're talking about um, a little bit of food processing, but we're looking at uh, a place used solely for producing and packaging maple syrup or concentrated maple sap for sale directly to consumer or to a food processing plant license under this section. If those sales, you know, said 5,000 in any 12 month period. So that's the, the kind of the important part of that. And what we talk about a lot is, is this dichotomy, right? So license exempt versus the food processing plant license. I'll have this information out for you. This is also on our website too. So if that's something you want to look up, um, we also have it out there. But one of the first questions I'll ask folks is, is the wholesaling, but really the adding ingredients and mixing in other syrups, right? So as soon as you were to add, um, let's say you want to make flavored maple syrup or, or, or something along those lines, then we're going to be looking at that food processing plant license uh, that kind of drives that and that, that facet. So um, that's one of the first questions I'll ask the folks. And that is something where if you are wholesaling that product, the state of Wisconsin would license you with the food processing plant license. Uh, label requirements for maple syrup can be found in... Uh, in ATCP, so again, that administrative code 87. So we're looking for it labeled according to standards found there or labeled ungraded at that point. Honey, honey is uh, another, another one we're looking at that no license, but what we are looking at, and these, these kind of help out, uh, I really like these slides, but we're asking a few questions, right? Do you buy the honey from other apiaries or do you add flavors, colors, or other ingredients? Um, kind of a common tenant as we talk about this is we're, we're processing that product. But if you say no and no, 
um, you're not going to need that license needed. Um, you could sell from home, farmers markets, retail, wholesale as an ingredient. However, if you say yes or yes, uh, we're going to be licensing with either a retail license. Um, so the retail license we're doing, if it's less than 25% of, our, of sales or wholesale. So um, we're talking about honey right now, but this, this theme down here is kind of an overarching theme that we ask and we talk about when we're licensing folks and we're trying to determine if they need a retail license or a food processing plant uh, slash wholesale license. We're asking about this 25%. Um, and this would deal with non-meat and non-dairy products, right? So um, if we're looking at uh, less than 25% of sales or wholesale, so that means you can do up to that 25% of your gross food sales as wholesale. But the majority, that 75% that or greater are retail, we're going to do that retail license. We're going to send you in that direction. Now, if we're thinking the opposite, that's going to be that wholesale. So you can do a little bit. Um, now, let's say you're 50-50. That might be a situation where you have to have both licenses. Um, again, reach. one of the things I will always stress is to reach out to us. Every circumstance is a little bit different. But um, that's kind of an overarching tenet, but uh, it's a really good information to have on this, this uh, honey specific um, slide. Okay, we're gonna talk about some nonprofits. So if you are holding a, if you have a 26 USC 501C, um, you're registered, the code allows for, um, for retail sales, non-meal, non-meal, uh, 12 or fewer days in a licensing year, we're gonna have exemptions for that. Um, we're going to talk about recommend that you follow transient event fact sheets. We want you to protect the public, um, even though it's exempt. Uh, the department has the authority to put food on hold that's been adulterated or misbranded, if that's the case. But generally, what we're seeing for this is that bakery, candies, pies, drinks, confection, those kind of stands. But that's going to be something we're asking that. Uh, and the word occasionally, where we're getting this 12 or fewer days here, in 75, the word occasionally is defined. And so that is something where we're not just picking that number out um, that is defined in code, that is defined in that administrative code 75. So then as we move on to over to the meal side of things, we're gonna see the, the day goes down, it, it's at three or less days in a calendar year. So same thing, we recommend transient uh, events fact sheet to protect the public. But here we see uh, really the definition here, and this is all an exemption part of the code, but we're looking at operated by church, religious, fraternal, youth, or patriotic organization, but we need it to be um, defined under that 26 UCSC 51C. And again, occasionally prepares, serves, or sells meals as transients or the general public. And so as we look at the definition, kind of break it down, we have the occasionally, so that's the three or less, prepares, serves, or sells. So it's not necessarily just that you're selling it, right? We're also looking at the prepare, serve, or sell. So I think that's an important distinction as we kind of move through this. So if you do need a license, what is that made out of? You know, let's say you need a transient license, mobile license, retail license, and we'll get into the transient a little bit more in the next couple of slides. We're going to talk about those specifically, but we have two parts to every license. We have the legal entity, whether it be a sole proprietorship, married couple, um, you know, whatever the case is, um, an LLC, another formed legal entity, and we have the facility. But generally, these licenses are not transferable. If one of those two things change, a new license is required. So that's something where um, we ask folks, you know, though if they move locations, they move, um, you know, let's say kitchens or the cases, we're going to ask about that. And if it, they do change that, then we're going to want to see that, you know, you reapply for that license or reapply for that license at that space. Um, another thing is maybe uh, that legal entity dissolves or something happens. Uh, we're going to be looking at. that license at that time for the retail food establishments i'm going to skip over to to here um actually let me go back sorry excuse me but we have this is for retail food so retail food establishment we have two 
uh, kind of sides of a coin. So we have the serving meals, that's 51% or greater. That's where you're serving meals. So fast food restaurant, something along those lines. And then not serving meals, uh, coffee shops, grocery store. Um, that's what we're kind of looking at that. But if we're talking specifically um, about transient, we'll go ahead and go to the next one. Transient, we do have um, serving meals, not serving meals. So these are the types of things that we we typically see at, at, at these, you know, farmers markets, fairs, festivals, whatever the case is. Um, we're going to be looking at, you know, the serving meals, not serving meals. But then specifically, as we kind of look into the transient license, which is um, transient license is something that we're going to be using at a special event. So they should be valid for a period not to exceed 14 days in conjunction with a special event, a specific special event. A special event is defined in code. It means a department recognized event that is sponsored, planned, organized, and publicly advertised by the by organizations that include the following, neighborhood associations, religious groups, cultural groups, political parties, churches, schools, sports teams, fraternal organizations, nonprofit organizations, or city, county, state, or federal governments. So it's a very specific, you know, um, you has to be at that, that, that actual special event. Um, otherwise, we'd be looking at a mobile retail license, which is something where you are street vending at that point. And I think there is a another um, feed webinar that talks about the mobile restaurants. So I um, encourage you to listen to that one if that's something you're looking into. That's kind of that, um, that dichotomy there where that's something we'll ask people specifically what they're doing because the, the regulations, the rules around it are a little bit different um, and the licensing process is a little bit different. So transient uh, license, um, here you see a couple great examples of what we'd see out and about at a farmer's market, fair, festival. We have a couple different levels to this. Um, we have processing potentially hazardous. So TCS is um, something that, you know, in, in our, you know, in, in the environmental health, we'll kind of throw around, but what we're looking at is time for temperature control for food. So it doesn't need refrigeration um, for food safety. But those levels are that processing um, potentially hazardous food, processing non-potentially hazardous food, and then no processing. Um, a, a food truck or trailer, so typically you see as like a you know mobile retail, they can be transient if they are satisfying the requirements of a of that chapter nine of the food code. Um, but what we're looking at for the processing, we're really looking at is the final product require refrigeration? So here we have something where the TCS that that potentially hazardous, right? Corn dog has to be hotter. Um, we're not looking for a, a room temperature hot, uh, corn dog or hot dog. No, thank you. Um, I, I don't want that. Uh, and then this does not need to be hot or cold, right? I think we'd prefer our donuts to be hot, right, uh, or fried. But but you can eat those at room temperature. But that's kind of the distinction that we're going to ask about. That's one of the first things we're going to ask when, we, when we're licensing folks or starting that conversation is, what is your end product? What are you looking to, to make? Uh, this is our pre-packaged level where you're going to see you know, that cool, those coolers in the back. I'm not sure if you can see those. I know the, the, uh, the picture is a little small, but um, you're going to see those coolers in the back. But everything is pre-packaged there. So you know how I was talking about those... Uh, you know, those chickens or the beef, uh, this is something where they're going to get that process and then they're operating at a special event. Um, everything is prepackaged. There's no sinks that are required. Um, you know, meat, eggs, uh, maybe cheesecakes, you know, packaged cheesecakes um, that aren't going to fall and that exemption of not being potentially hazardous. But these are the things that would require that prepackaged level of the transient license. I spoke about this a little bit, but um, only at the special events. I just want to reiterate that, reiterate that, because that is really the, the driving force for a transient license is the special event part of it. That is a key part of the definition. It's a key part of um, whether you get that license or not. Um, special events can also be um, concerts, sporting events, trade shows, the flea markets, 
uh, pu public exhibitions by artists, craftsmen, or vehicle enthusiasts, fair, carnival, circus, um, or government governmentally recognized celebration based on a specific calendar date, such as a holiday or anniversary, or any other event approved by the regulatory agency. Uh, one key part, a potluck is not a special event. So the limits of a transient license. You can't operate as a street vendor. So if you're looking to set up shop somewhere on a, on a Thursday night uh, outside um, that and it's just, you know, out on the street, and let's just say you're, you're, that would be something where we looked at mobile license, which uh, Nicole will touch on in that the next, uh, I think it's a couple webinars down the road, but um, that is something where Nicole will touch on that a little bit more. Um, you can't operate in parking lots, street corners, private property, um, but a mobile retail, you can do both of those things. So it really encompasses the special events and that street vending. So that's something where you have to have a service base. Um, we're looking at a few more regulations as, uh, involved with that. But this is something that uh, we typically send out to folks as we talk about temporary food service guidelines. Um, this is a Wisconsin food code fact sheet. So I like to send these out and, and the state has a whole listing on their website of these, but they break down the food code into kind of what I think about as bite-sized chunks. So we'll have ones about cooling, cold holding, hot holding, uh, how to stack your refrigerator so that, um, you know, you have right to eat foods on top and, and you're or, uh, yeah, on top and you're, and you're going down by cook temperature. But one of the things that we send out with every transient uh, processing, whether it potentially has a food or not, is we send out these temporary food service guidelines. These touch on a number of different topics. We have demonstration of knowledge, employee health. We're going to be talking about your hand washing. So uh, transient license, you need to have um, a, it's just like a, a spigot, but we're having, we're looking for a continuous flow of water in a five gallon bucket where you can wash your hands and, and let the water run over it while you have soap there. And then you have something to catch it. So that's what we're looking for in order to describe those things. We're looking for a way to wash and sanitize uh, equipment utensils. So typically folks will have like three bus tubs. It'll touch on those requirements. Um, same with like overhead protection. Um, we're going to be looking at, you know, sanitizer. So making sure if you're using bleach that you have, you know, bleach that is effective um, or other sanitizer. And then that you have a way to test that, right? So that you're doing that at the appropriate concentration. Because one of the easiest things to do is to, uh, to use too much bleach, um, you know, in, in, in that circumstance. So that's something that would touch on this um, temporary food service guideline. So that's something that really helps out. Um, I'll show it at the end. Once we get the questions, I'll kind of go through it and we can talk about it a little bit more. Um, I have it pulled up. So absolutely. So your licensing process. Uh, we have a couple different things in the state of Wisconsin. We have a multi-jurisdictional licensing program. And so what that means is that approximately two thirds of the states, and it might be a little bit more, um, these are rough approximates. They are the retail and the recreational program. So transient licenses, grocery stores, gas stations, restaurants, um, hotels, uh, tourist rooming houses, pools. Those inspections are done by the local health department. So for example, uh, where I am in the state, uh, Waukesha County, for example, has its own health department and they're the ones who would do these inspections. The transient license, like let's say you get a transient license through, uh, through uh, Waukesha County, excuse me, you can operate in Waukesha County, but you can operate throughout the whole state of Wisconsin with that transient license. It is recognized throughout the entire state. Now, if you go to a different local health department, they may charge an inspection fee. They are, they are allowed to do that, but they have to recognize that license. So, and then for example, uh, again, in the part of the state I'm in, uh, Walworth County, that is something that is regulated and licensed by the state of Wisconsin. So we would complete, we would send our inspectors, our sanitarians out there to do that inspection. So the state license versus that local municipality, um, those are good throughout the state of Wisconsin. When we're talking about transient licenses. So um, just to keep that in mind as we're moving forward. But um, so that really brings up that first point, which is the location determines the licensing agency. Oftentimes this can be one of the first questions we ask you. Where are you based? What county are you in? Um, 
the then depending on what you say, um, that will trigger whether we say, okay, you need to talk to this health department and we'll send you the information for it. Um, we have all the information. We'll help you out. I will send you a, a email with their website, their email and the phone number. That's something that we like to make it as easy for folks as possible. Uh, but we, if it's in our part of the state where, this, where the department would actually inspect it, we will provide the application and information on facility requirements in addition to any trainings or certificates or anything like that that you would need. We're going to send out a step-by-step -step list of instructions on an email that will help you out. We'll also mail it out to you too if you don't have email. But we're going to send you that step-by-step -step process to get that done. You're going to complete the application. You're going to return it with a license fee. And then we're going to process it. It gets sent to the inspector of the area, and they're actually going to call you or email you and schedule that licensing inspection. So we're going to work directly with you, and they're going to say, hey, this is what works for me, what works for you. You guys are going to have a conversation, and either you're going to go out to that facility and you're going to get licensed or they'll do it administratively, but it's all going to be based on um, that, that, that relationship at that point when they call you. Um, then they'll come out. And your facility is officially licensed or if something is, you know, um, not quite right or whatever the case is, they might do a conditional license or, um, you know, and, and set a condition like you have to get this done within 30, 60, 90 days. But they will work with you on an individual basis to get that done. One of the things I want to just highlight here, contact us early in the process. Uh, my team and I, we are dedicated um, to getting back to folks really quick. Um, we really like to keep it within one business day that we're, we're talking to folks that we're making, you know, we're at least addressing saying, you know, we got your email, we got your phone call, here's the information, or if it's something more complicated, we'll get the right, we'll get the answer. We'll, we'll find the right person. But we just encourage folks to contact us early in the process. Even if we're not the ones doing the licensing, like I described, where it's a local health department, We'll, we can provide that information to get that contact. Or if you're looking online, our online uh, platform will actually send you the information for that local health department. So it's actually quite a nice system. So um, we really want to make this um, as easy as possible for folks, right? Um, obviously, we all want to produce safe food. We all want to protect the public. Um, but we also want to make that licensing process, you know, like I said in the beginning with the mission statements, fair, effective, and efficient. That's what we strive to do. Um, we want folks to know the regulations that apply to your business and product. We will send you the information, uh, you know, whether it's that 75, those temporary food service guidelines, that's something we want to send out to folks. We encourage, and encourage people to purchase foods from approved sources. Uh, anticipate response to changes in products, formulations, and suppliers. Just things to think about as we're moving forward. Obtain the license before operation and renew a license on time to avoid additional charges. Um, another key point is, is protecting your investments, right? We want you to take temperatures, monitor the food, make sure that people are washing their hands, make sure they're wearing hair nets, make sure they don't have uh, tons of uh, watches and jewelry on, right? These things that we want to make sure that we're, we're providing that safe food. Um, be aware of what is happening and, and update your inspector. You can call them. You can, you can email them. You know, ask them questions. They want to help you. Um, we really just want to have the end goal of safe food. We're here as a resource. We're educating as much as possible and we enforce as necessary to protect the citizens of Wisconsin. Uh, and I really wanted to highlight this last part. Ask questions. Ask questions. We're here to help out. Uh, in that case, here are, here's our general inquiry line. Uh, when you call this number, you're going to leave a voicemail. Uh, like I said, my team, which is uh, four of us, we, we monitor this throughout the day. We're constantly checking this. You leave a voicemail. You say your, you know, what you'd like, what you're, what you're looking to do. We'll call you back and we'll help you out. So this is something. Um, you can also email us directly. So that's another easy way to get in touch with us is this email. Uh, it'll be on the last slide and, and uh, we'll help you out there. So um, renewal or billing inquiries is our support. Um, we'll, we'll help you out there if you need to get there. But um, at this time, any questions? Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Charlie. Um, yeah. Round of applause for sharing that really helpful information. Appreciate it. Um, and for folks on the call, I know there were 
a few questions um, mentioned in the chat. Okay. We, uh, just a few. So we could start, I can uh, pull those up and um, we can start there. And then if there's additional, we have time for any other questions um, that people might have. So while we have Charlie here on the call, um, it's a great opportunity to check in if there's something that he touched on that you want more information about or something that wasn't mentioned. Um, I got it up to. Yeah. Uh, okay. Okay. Uh, what is required to grill hamburgers at a farmer's market? That would be the uh, processing potentially hazardous food because that end product would need uh, some sort of temperature control if not being consumed immediately, of course, but um, that would be a processing potentially hazardous food. Fresh, fresh beef, pork cuts, born and raised, processed without ever leaving same location, also mobile processing. Uh, can I ask what you mean by by that one, if, if able to? Otherwise, we can talk offline, too, if you want to kind of explain that one a little bit more in detail. But um, mobile processing would be like a mobile slaughtering. Uh, I, I don't know a ton about that. The, the meat poultry folks are, are more well-versed in that topic, but that would be that mobile processing maybe that I was talking about. Otherwise, that might be like a food truck trailer uh, for mo mobile processing, um, which would be either a transient or a mobile retail license. Um, badger tailgating that would these are more if you're selling to the general public uh, when I think tailgating I'm thinking that they're doing more to like friends and family unless I'm misunderstanding that but uh, yeah tailgating you know if you're selling to the general public we'd want to see some sort of um, transient license you know at that point that could be under that special uh event definition with that the sporting events so um that would just depend on the situation and who you're selling to um what we're really geared towards is selling towards the general public i hope that helps out um, if i sell a condiment hot sauce but only get a retail license to sell do i have to keep it refrigerated at all times or only after opening uh if you are are you selling it or are you making it that would be my first question there. Um, and after that, if you're just selling it, for example, I would ask to look at the, the manufacturer label and what it says on there, if it's, if it's going to want you to refrigerate after opening or not. She said making and selling, or put that in the chat oh. at least. Oh, making and selling. So hot sauce is one where we would ask for a process authority, which is a food safety expert to take a look at that to make sure that it, if it's an acid food or not. Uh, or if it's a low acid canned food, kind of to find that definition for it. And so that would be something where um, it, it would really, that would depend on that if it's an acid food, um, if, it's, if it's below that pH um, and we'd ask for some sort of exemption letter or something along those lines for a hot sauce. Otherwise, if it was canning, then that would be something that we would look at a, uh, a food processing plant license. Uh, sorry, I'm just reading this one. I apologize. That's okay. I can read it too. If you, so uh, it looks like, yeah, there's a question about mentioning that mobile units for packaged meat was not acceptable. And what if the mobile unit um, meat is then processed at a USDA facility? And, and that, that was more on the mobile slaughtering side, I think with that mm -hmm. slide. Um, so the packaged meat, it would depend on the, the inspection legend on it, um, if it's USDA or state, and then going across, um, to be, go across state lines and be sold, it would need to have that USDA uh, inspection legend on it. Looking for additional funding to complete meat processing classes, funding from the VA was, uh, stat cap, any, I do not know the answer to that question, Gary, I apologize, um, but that's something where if you send me that question, I can absolutely get that out to the right folks. I will forward that on to either a supervisor or kind of see where we are with that. But uh, offhand, I don't know the answer to that question. I apologize. Uh, do you have any information on allergen and dietary restrictions or legal gluten-free licensing? In regards to allergen, if you are making it at a food processing plant, um, that is something where you'd have to have that allergen on the label itself. 
uh, gluten-free licensing, that is something where it would be, if you're labeling it like that, you would have to look at the, it's uh, 21, the Code of Federal Regulations, but it's 21 CFR 101, which is labeling. Um, I'd have to look that up, to be honest with you, uh, for the gluten-free. Uh, you do have to meet certain stipulations and it gets kind of really kind of complicated with the with the the labeling portion of that so again send it in we can send it over to our folks but um, that is something where when I was looking at labeling if it went outside of the kind of the broad um, five things that we kind of that I generally look for but you know name of the product ingredient listing and prominence of order uh, allergens net weight or quantity if we had things that were outside of that uh, declaration of responsibility excuse me if we had things outside of that, that's something where I would be looking that up and that CFR to see what was going on. Uh, you know, good example of some of those major box stores where they have, you know, the specific, whether it's like the heart healthy labeling or something like that, we would be looking at um, some of that really kind of getting into the nitty gritty of that, that CFR, that code of federal regulations. Uh, thanks. Would you consider presenting just a honey content to a beekeeping association? Uh, absolutely. You can send that request in uh, for a speaking engagement. Absolutely. Please send that into our uh, licensing email. I'll see if I can actually put that in the chat. Give me one second here. We can do that if you want to keep. Yeah. Oh, sure. Keep rolling. Yeah, yeah <laughs> absolutely. Exactly. Thank you. Um, yeah, absolutely. Send that into our, uh, our, our email. Can the address on the label be a post office box actress or the for the pickleball or cottage law? Uh, I'll touch on the judge's ruling quickly. Uh, there are no labeling requirements for the judge's ruling. Uh, so that is something where um, that would not be something we would look at for the label. Uh, and then for the pickleball, it's just, let me, I'm gonna look quick and just make sure that I'm not misspeaking here. So give me one second. Just the name and address of the person who did the canning. So I would, I would, yeah, if that's your address, then yes. Is there transient alcohol licensing, mobile bar catering? That would fall under um, 125 for the, it's a Wisconsin statute, but it's 125. Um, we wouldn't look at anything for alcohol. We're looking if it's just alcohol, right? If it's just like a, a beer or a, or a bar, um, they'd have to be food that we'd be looking at unless it's the manufacturing of alcohol. When it comes to manufacturing, um, beer, wine, things of that nature, then we are going to be licensing it and uh, either doing a retail food license or a food processing plant license. Inspection of serving ice or fruit. Uh, uh, are you going to be making the ice on site and fruit? It would depend if it was past that harvest cut or not. If it's past the harvest cut, that'd be something we'd be looking at that. Serving ice. Um, yeah, ice would be something that's a food where you're ingesting it. So yeah, we'd look at a license for that, like a lemonade stand or something along those lines. Do we need a license for making green smoothies and fresh vegetables from the farm, so the farm store and farmer's market and does this consider processing? Yes, yes. Uh, that would be processing if you're, yeah, if you're actually cutting it, blending it, making it into a smoothie. Um, and if it's not a direct, uh, direct to consumer sales or retail sale. Uh, it would need to be a food processing plant license if you're looking to wholesale it. That's what I'm thinking about when you say like a farm store. Uh, and once you're wholesaling it, you have to have that five log reduction for a juice product. Or if it's a, or it's a smoothie, sorry, excuse me. If it's a juice product, we'd be looking at a five log reduction for wholesaling. But at the farmer's market, you absolutely do some smoothies and we would we would license under a transient license. And it would just depend if the if the end product was potentially hazardous or not. Uh, Deanne, I will send you, I have a labeling guidance that I can absolutely send you. That's uh, very, very helpful. Let me get that going quick. Yeah, 
And we're going to send a follow up email to everybody uh, as one more request to do the evaluation so we can add these um, the, the okay. additional things that that Charlie's looking up now in that in that follow up email within the hour. Uh, here's the labeling one I just sent in the chat. Hopefully everybody can see that. Yep. And, okay, so can we revisit what you need to sell cook burgers? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, that would be a, I'm going to share my screen again. Okay. Can everybody see that? Hopefully. Fact sheet. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yep. Mm -hmm. So this is the temporary food service guidelines. This would be something you'd look at if we were um, looking at selling, I think burgers you said. So we'd be looking at um, this specifically, but uh, for example, cold storage, it would be a processing potentially hazardous license. So it'd be that, that transient license, but processing potentially hazardous. We'd be looking at cold storage. Um, Mechanical refrigeration units must be provided to keep potentially as foods at or below 41. Ice can be used for transportation um, and it can be used if it's demonstrated that it can maintain those food temperatures below 41. So we wanna see that they can maintain that temperature. Um, we'd be looking at the cooking, making sure that you're hitting those uh, minimum right temperatures right there. So if it's ground raw beef, 155, those are things that we'd be looking at. Hot holding 135 or above. These are the things that we would be looking for if we were doing that inspection. So this is a good place to start. Or chapter um, chapter 10 of the food code. Uh, Okay, Wisconsin Cottage Food Association promotes best practices for labeling using, uses the pickle bill labeling example for cottage baked unrefrigerated foods. Yeah, I would encourage you to look at, I will send this in the chat as well, but the state of Wisconsin site is the one that we refer to on uh, pretty much a daily basis, but this is the one that we talk about that we kind of look at as, as uh, if we have a determination to make, this is the one that we are, we are referencing or looking at. So this, this one is right from the state website. Um, I don't, to be honest with you, don't, I don't look at the, I, I haven't looked at the third party ones. Um, I just look at the, the state one because that's the one that um, we, we send out to folks. So. Uh, okay, I think I got the mobile bar one. Is license needed to prepare smoothies, tea in a commercial space. However, space is not open for public access, no walk-ins, inspection needed, space is used for delivery options or curbside pickup. Yes, it's still a retail sale, so it would need a license. I am thinking, reading this, uh, probably a retail license. That would be my first thought for this. Um, if it's a permanent retail food establishment, it would probably be along the lines of, I didn't really touch on it today, but it would be a permanent retail food establishment. So like a restaurant or a grocery store, but oh, in that same vein, um, even if there's, you know, if you're doing it direct to consumer sales um, and that would be, yeah, delivery and curbside pickup would both be delivery or uh, retail sales direct to consumer. So that would be something we'd probably be looking at that probably similar to like some of those coffee shops, those walk-up coffee bars, I'm thinking possibly, but it would just depend on your, you know, your space and what you were looking at. Uh, thank you. So yeah, if, uh, if anyone else has additional, we could probably take a couple more questions. Um, please, you're welcome to unmute and just um, ask your question out loud if you'd like to, or if you feel more comfortable, um, you're welcome to put it in the chat. Um, there's some good, Charlie mentioned just a couple of links that he put in the chat. I just want to draw your attention to about, um, the labeling link and then, um, the link he just mentioned about the homemade, the home licenses and homemade, uh, baked goods information. So, and then a little bit earlier than that, um, we put in the chat, the information about how to contact the food licensing consultants, um, phone numbers and emails. 
email address. Ooh, that's a question I can't answer. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> yes, I can answer that one. Um, the We are going to put the recordings up. And it sometimes takes a couple weeks to get it through the, the UW-Madison system. Um, <laughs> but hopefully uh, within, within the next two weeks, we'll have the recording up. So absolutely, yes, the recordings will be up. And we'll also send everybody who registered uh, email when those are posted. And I can send any of the information that I talked about today. Like, I mean, truly, just just reach out to us. We we can help folks. We want to help folks. This is our job. We want to send that education, you know, materials. We really do want to just send it out. So, please reach out. Licensing sometimes is hard in these, you know, scenarios because every single one is a little bit different. There's so many different circumstances and, and sometimes just knowing the specifics of the business can really help so that we can make that accurate licensing determination, depending on the, the situation, the, the space, uh, who you're looking to sell to, those all affect those different paths that we take as we're trying to figure that out. But reach out okay. to, you know, even if you reach out to us first, even if it's a local health department, we'll get you that information. Well, it looks like we, I think we can take this one last, well, maybe one or two last questions quickly, but uh, there's one about someone has a licensed winery and a, has a food processing license. They're on a wine trail and considering having food and wine pairing events. Can they get a transient license to have this kind of involvement? It would need to meet the the special event definition. So that would be the big thing. If you wanted to get a transient license, it would need to meet that special event definition. If it didn't, um, you'd have to have a mobile retail license or a uh, a retail food license. But if it's on your premise, I would give a call too, because it'll depend on if you're serving meals. So absolutely give us a call but it, again it would depend on that definition if you're meeting the definition of a, of a special event then yes you could do that transient license it would be an option for you if not then no we'd have to look at other alternatives like the mobile retail or the permanent retail food establishment um, those kind of options do local county health have a list of uh, available commissaries i have one that we regularly send out i'll see if i can find it quickly um it's actually through the uw extension i think you guys is it i don't know if... there's a lot of us so uh, yeah I, I i didn't personally put it together but whoever yeah, did I I, i'm happy to take credit <laughs> no, i just gotta find it but uh i don't know if if, if a county health will have a list of available commissaries the inspectors themselves might have a good idea of different incubator kitchens or different areas where you actually can process they can kind of help you out as a government agency we can't necessarily recommend one over the other or even give you know really suggestions um we are limited to um that part of it uh but if you're looking for, you know, different areas to, to have that permanent, I tell folks to reach out to local, you know, maybe restaurants, schools, churches, things that can be retail licensed or food processing plant licensed. Uh, if you're looking for like a service space or whatever the case is for the commissary, um, you know, these are things that you can look at, but uh, I, I'm on the spot now with trying to find this link, but. <laughs> um, it's okay. And, we, and like Jess uh, mentioned, when we send the follow-up, email um we can include some some of the links and attachments and that sort of thing so people okay. can keep an eye out for that oh okay so fast um look like there was a last quick question about whether pet food and treats need a license yep i can send you that information if you'd like it so we do have uh an email specifically about pet treats animal feed and uh and dog food. So uh, I can, here, I'll share this quick. I can kind of show you quickly, but th this is like an example of what we, you know, might send out to folks, but this is a, uh, this is what we send out for like a pet treat, for example. So yeah, reach out, but we'll, we, we'd send to this, right. It's a, it's a, a list of everything that you need to get that license. So That's absolutely. Great. Thank you. Well, I want to work right up on three. So I uh, just want to say thanks, big thanks again to Charlie um, for coming on today and sharing all this information. 
Um, and just real quick in the chat, you can see the link to the evaluation survey if you have a few minutes. Again, it just helps us keep doing these kinds of programs and improving them. Um, we have four more sessions um, in the month of April for um, webinar series. And so the one that's coming up next is next Monday, April 8th, 2 p.m. And it's making money with your food truck. Um, so thanks again to Charlie and to everyone who is able to join us. And we'll be sending the follow-up information. And hope you have a good rest of your day. Take thanks care. Everybody. Thank you. Bye.